Hello, everyone. Welcome back to War and Literature, English 1120. I'm uh, Tim Wilson. And <clears throat> tonight we're going to uh, undertake a bit of an introduction to World War I uh, and its effect on poetry and literature. So we'll start with that in the next lecture, which is the recorded lecture for Wednesday. We'll look at modernism more, more broadly as a movement. I want to just uh, take a moment to um, acknowledge that uh, for most of you who are able to submit your, your research assignments on Friday, I think generally well done. I think, uh, I think the classes, the class average was fairly good uh, on that assignment around a B. So I would say, uh, as I said, fairly well done overall. Um, so for many of you, it'll be a lower mark than we had for the first two assignments, because remember those were you know, basically uh, you're, everyone was getting A pluses as long as you showed up. So, so it's par for the course to have a little bit of a lower mark. Don't be shocked by that. Some of the things I noticed um, would, would be, as always, um, with, 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 with some of the essays, attention to the specificity of the thesis and the concepts in the thesis. So should be fairly clear at the beginning the concepts such as leadership, what are the dimensions of leadership you're going to look at? A lot of people looked at, let's say, Henry V as a leader. And okay, so what does it mean? What, what, what dimensions? How Scope that down for us in terms of how you're going to prove that thesis. <clears throat> so that's one example. I would say one, one source of confusion, at least for just for uh, clarity of expression, would be around um, some people let's say not clearly distinguishing between Henry V as a play and Henry V as a character in the play and Henry V as a historical character. So a lot of people, um, let's say we're talking about uh, those three kind of interchangeably on the, on the latter point, I'll just, for instance, some people were pointing out that um, Shakespeare shows the, uh, well, or, or Shakespeare's Henry V um, displayed a lot of military prowess in his tactical genius of using the long bows and putting the, the army between two forests. So Shakespeare doesn't talk about any of that, right? So that's part of the point that, um, so the historical Henry V did that. So there's a difference between the historical Henry V and Henry V as portrayed in the play. So if you're talking about how Shakespeare presents Henry V, make sure that you're not confusing those two issues. Shakespeare's play is not a novel, technically speaking. So people will say, so be careful. Novel is a very specific fictional prose form that basically over the last couple hundred years. So don't, if you're doing an essay on Plato's Republic, don't call it the, a novel. If you're doing a, uh, an essay on, uh, on a Shakespearean play, don't call it a novel. If you're doing a, an essay on Kant's critique of pure reason for another class, don't call it a novel. But as I said, a lot of people just call any book a novel. Um, so those were the kinds of things that stood out for me. Uh, if you have uh, any specific questions on your own, let, on, on your own uh, work, let me know uh, offline. But without further ado, I'd like to get started. We'll, we'll share the PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> So as discussed, we're going to look today at, well, first we're going to re recapitulate a little bit. So recap some of the themes that we've covered in the course so far through the first three major works we've covered, Homer, Virgil, and Shakespeare, to set us up for how things change with, with Virginia Woolf and with, with World War I and with modernism. <clears throat> then we're going to look at the effect of World War I on uh, on literature directly and, and what this kind of, uh, this product of World War I, World War I poetry. In the next lecture, we'll look at modernism. <clears throat> so as a recap, um, the, the first two works we looked at, Homer and Virgil, were in this broad, uh, broadly speaking, classical tradition. So from, from the time of Homer up to the up to the Renaissance, so ancient and medieval period. 
So in Homer, we saw that, and, the, and broadly speaking for that entire period, that classical tradition, meaning is found in relation to a divine or cosmic ends or purposes. So meaning of war, meaning of anything, meaning of one's own life is, is seen in relation to a divine or cosmic whole and, and things have ends or purposes, okay? So in the ancient uh, example of Homer, we have the meaning of war in relation to individual's mortality. That's a, a particular type of the individual's end, end in a temporal sense and, uh, of, of finitude. Um, and we, we see that life unfolding in relation to the cosmic whole. And I think we can't put enough emphasis on the shield of Achilles as, as being a nice encapsulation of that cosmic whole. And we see the meaning of war in relationship to glory. And we, uh, so, so uh, uh, Kleos and, and honor, Time. And we talked quite a bit about that in relation to Homer's text. Then with Virgil, the meaning of war, there, there's still those dimensions of relation to the cosmic whole, but with a new emphasis in Virgil on the meaning of war in relationship to the human community. Um, and part of the, the cosmic fate of the community. So there Aeneas's shield has less to do with the cosmic whole as a static unity, but as, as the community unfolding in history. And the emphasis in, in Virgil was on the piety or duty to family, to the community, to gods that is displayed by the hero. And we didn't read this, but we had a lecture that provided a transition from the medieval age to the modern age. <clears throat> and there I pointed out that uh, St. Augustine with other medieval thinkers, we see the, the meaning of war in relationship to divine providence. So is what is the meaning of this war, this conflict in terms of advancing God's plan for pe uh, particular people or for the unfolding of Christian truth? Then with modernity, broadly speaking, this, this large movement of the last 500 years or so, we could see that as a process of secularization and abandoning divine ends or, or natural ends and finding meaning in human goals. Humans are positing their own goals, okay? So first with Shakespeare, we see an example of what, what I called the first wave of modernity and um, here uh, in, in Shakespeare, we, we see maybe a critique of the rhetoric of leaders used to, to unify a country behind war. So we, we talked a bit about that in Henry V. But ultimately war as, as a necessary instrument to unify a modern political regime. So it's not a radical questioning of war, but it's, it's somewhat a modern perspective on war, kind of poking a hole in some of the classical notions of glory and honor and, and piety within war, but still seeing it as necessary for a modern political regime. <clears throat> um, and then in the 19th century, again, we didn't, we don't, we didn't study closely any examples of this, but um, in the 19th century, we see the second wave of modernity and the meaning of war is is in the securing of, a, of an ethnic homeland, uh, not, not necessarily the regime as a political regime, but as a, as a nation understood as a cultural and ethnic unity. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's a question of that as manifesting human freedom, not let's say a divine ordaining necessarily. <clears throat> and then in the 20th century, we see the third wave of modernity and uh, with World War I in particular, kind of the previous ways of in which war was grounded and given meaning are seen to be senseless or baseless. So like doing this for a nation, doing this for God, doing this for glory, doing this for piety, none of those reasons that might, might have been posited in previous ages seems to make sense in the 20th century any longer. Here's a uh, a little bit kind of more of a schematic representation of what I just said in terms of the different works that we studied and how they correspond to different ages and let's say thematics or, or ways of framing meaning in war. So I won't repeat that, but it's kind of a way of schematizing it. 
here's our trusty timeline to give us a sense again of of where we are. Um, we're over here um, looking at uh, World War One, so close to um, so close to the present day in, when it comes to taking a long view, at least of the texts we've studied and the context of those texts over the last uh, 3000 years or so, uh, World War I is, is a blink of an eye uh, in terms of its, its distance from us, much closer to us than the Aeneid was to, <clears throat> to even the Third Punic War, which as I said, is, is almost an immediate context for it let alone the Trojan War, which it, it pur uh, purports to be depicting in some way. So the Trojan War over a thousand years before that, whereas World War I still very fresh for us and even more fresh obviously for, for Virginia Woolf, who's writing uh, really in the shadow of it. <clears throat> I wanna give you a sense here of how the, the works the work we're about to study, Virginia Woolf and, and World War I poetry, how it fits into uh, this kind of timeline of English literary history. So this, this classical tradition that I've been describing of, of ancient and then medieval works, um, we can see over here and goes up to, in terms of English authors, Chaucer, includes the Beowulf poet and other old English authors. Then with the Renaissance, we get this break with modernity and Shakespeare, Spencer, Sidney, Sir Thomas More, Milton, other authors are in this general period. And then often people talk about in terms of English literary periods, the restoration in 18th century. So that's the, the tail end of the 17th century and the 18th century. So we have, uh, in terms of prominent authors there, Dr Dryden, Jonathan Swift, Alexander Pope, Samuel Johnson. Then Romanticism follows hard on the heels of that. And, and, and basically it's a, a kind of a generational thing there that happened at the cusp of the 19th century. And, and we have figures such as Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, and Shelley. And then in terms of English literary periods, Victorian literature, uh, is, is that literature written broadly speaking on during the reign of Queen Victoria and, and we have authors such as Tennyson, Bron uh, Bronte, the Bronte sisters, um, uh, Thomas Carlyle, George Eliot, and Matthew Arnold. And then this uh, period of the first half of the 20th century is this I've highlighted here is where we find Virginia Woolf. So it's uh, this very recent uh, period um, the first half of the 20th century is a good way of framing it. Um, and we have in that same period, uh, Yeats, T.S. Eliot, Auden, others uh, that we could point to. Um, and uh, the, the, the periods are, are ones largely representative of the English literary periods. But as I said, you, we could be talking about in terms of the history of, of ideas, we could think of it this way. Uh, the, there's different ways of slicing that up. <clears throat> so World War I and poetry. So we'll look at war poetry quickly before World War I. We'll look at World War I, you know, make sure we're on the same page, what happened there. And uh, we'll look at a couple of World War I poets very quickly. So as we know from the course, war is this perennial topic, right? So uh, as, as long as there's been literature that we can find, war has been a thematic for it from the earliest literature that we know, Epic of Gilgamesh to the most recent. And um, often it points to the limits of war, but it all ultimately throughout that whole tradition has, has always seemed to find a positive ground for or a meaning in war. And, uh, right up, uh, up until the 19th century. And in the 19th century too, often that, that meaning of war was tied to a certain nationalism or patriotism, okay? So it's not necessarily as it was with Homer, individual glory, but let's say the um, giving oneself to as for, the, for the nation as, as this uh, uh, cultural ethnic unity. 
Um, and examples here, we'll just look at one of these, but Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson's Concord Hymn, um, which is a, a reflection on the American Revolutionary War. Uh, uh, Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, many people might know that. Uh, so uh, a, a reflection on a, a battle in the Crimean War, this, this light brigade getting mowed down by, by cannons and um, the, the poem, as I said, many people probably know it. The poem is definitely a lament at how silly an order it was to command the, these horses to charge into this valley of death and certainly get slaughtered by these the, this high powered cannons and stuff like that. But it's also ultimately a celebration of the bravery and the obedience of these uh, these cavalry, and it's a it's a, a paean, a, a praising of that courage. You know, that's ultimately what that poem is. You know, it's, it's it was a stupid order and it was futile, but it wasn't it great that they would do it? And because theirs is to do and die. You know, and it's not to it's not to not to question these things. And uh, another example there, I just gave a few examples. Uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, which is a reflection on the American Civil War. So let's look a little bit at the uh, the Concord Hymn. <clears throat> so the uh, battles of Lexington and Concord in April 1775 uh, marked the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. We see a picture on the right of the site of this uh, ob obelisk monument that was dedicated to the Battle of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of April 1775. And it's it, the monuments dedicated in 1837 and Emerson writes this Concord hymn for the occasion of this dedication. And you can see this monuments by this little feeble bridge. It's actually a bridge that was reconstructed since the battle over this little creek. Okay, so this is kind of this and the pastures around the site of this, this battle. And, and we're talking about a, almost a skirmish, really, of farmers with rifles and and uh, you know small small uh, detachment of uh, British military. So this is the Concord hymn. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, alike the conqueror silent sleeps. And time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. On this green bank by this soft stream, we set today a boat of stone that memory may their deed redeem when like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise for them in thee. So a couple of things to note. Uh, well, first of all, before I turn, um, I'll just stay here. We can notice the regular rhythm, the regular meter, um, very almost uh, something you'd almost expect from Shakespeare earlier ages. <clears throat> This will be gone. Okay, this will after World War One. This is abandoned. You know, well, not just World War One. We'll talk about modernism in the next lecture. But World War One, let's say, one of the many factors. But a sense of regular form in poetry or, or other artistic uh, expression. So let's say visual arts or music having regular symmetrical form, uh, absolutely abandoned. And what we get are fragments, and we get jarring shifts of meter. We get jarring shifts of perspective within the same work, OK? And again, think literature as well as visual arts and music. <clears throat> so here, still just a, you know, not even 100 years earlier, uh, 1837, still very much able to have kind of a, a regular form here. Some other points I'll just highlight there is, is that the, the poem is in this kind of tradition of commemoration. So wars are often fought on the, these grand scales, kind of representing you know, immense human effort and, and, and in terms of immense loss of life. Um, <clears throat> but there's also these kind of built artifacts of war. So Homer, for instance, depicts those thousand ships that formed the Greek expedition or the mighty walls of Troy. 
surrounding the Greek camp. We, we talked about these mighty, in, in Homer, you get these indications of these mighty human artifacts, the Greek walls as well as a mighty human artifact, but, but they are also highlighted as things that the gods can kick over quite easily, right? The God, and the gods are like time or the cosmos dispense with uh, like, like a sand castle that's eroded overnight. <clears throat> So to hear uh, Emerson's poem points to an artifact, a bridge that was over the river where the Battle of Concord was fought. And, and here it's, it's a humble little artifact. You know, it's not this immense walls or a thousand ships or, you know, in, in World War II, the, the million mines and, and uh, other, other impediments to a, a Western invasion that the Germans had lined on those beaches around Normandy. So there are immense efforts. Here we're talking about a, a, a tiny humble bridge. So that's the first line, it's a humble bridge. And it's not tied to the act of war making itself. It connects it rather to the simple farmers that we see in the next lines. So the, the American soldiers are these simple farmers. And this is echoing a Roman tradition of Republican citizen soldiers. They're citizens who are tied to the land. They pick up their arms to, to to you know, jealously protect their freedoms. Then, rather than try to tyrannically hold on to power, they put down their weapons and go back to the farms. And, and in Roman history, the model for this is a, a figure named Cincinnatus, who did this in uh, in the early days of the Republic. <clears throat> so, so this simple bridge is is tied to the simple nature of the farmers. They're tied to the land, not necessarily to war making. And here too, the time erases all of the traces of these human artifacts, great and small. So remember how in the Iliad, he's describing the walls around the Greek camp and Homer says, defying the deathless gods, they built that wall. And so it stood there steadfast, no long time. And then he, he says later, so in the years to come Poseidon and God Apollo, Apollo would set all things to rights once more. So the, it's as if by humans erecting these artifacts, we're out, out of order or committing an injustice against the cosmos and the gods, and or in the case of Emerson's poem, it's time sets things to right once more. And here, uh, you know, time, the ruined bridge, bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. So the traces of the war and the lives are lost. They're washed away in time. So no matter how great the artifact, it will wash away in time. And, and so too with monuments that we erect for war. So we have that Concord obelisk we have here on the right, more uh, closer to home. If, you're, if you happen to be here in Ottawa and not following this virtually from another part of the world here in Ottawa, the, the, the war memorial just, uh, just beside Parliament Hill. Um, these are, are great ways to commemorate and to try to, for a community to try to remember the, the actions of hero, the heroic deeds of previous generations, but they too, they will be swept away with time. These will not last forever. Uh, even the pyramids are, will not, are, not, are destined not to last forever, although they're symbols of, 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 of built artifacts that endure for a very, very long time. Um, so what we have and what's probably most enduring are rituals and literature. So stories that we tell one another and, and, but it also serves this kind of commemoration function. It serves the same kind of commemoration function, stories and ritual. And the art of telling the story, the actual act of telling the story is part of that ritual. So bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. So in a way what's being erected with the obelisk is this poem. So in some way, this poem is hopefully going to endure and, and time will spare it like the obelisk and will maybe spare it for a longer time than the obelisk since it can be repeated and remembered by different generations, whereas the obelisk itself will decay. So, uh, <clears throat> so we see in the Concord Hymn an example of uh, literature's relation to war as commemoration, as ritual of commemoration of previous, uh, of previous conflict. And in some ways, that's what, right from the beginning, that, that's what uh, the Iliad was in some ways, right? A celebration of the, the feats of the ancestors. 
Now, World War I. So as I said, this was our, our, our example of pre-World War I war literature was this Concord hymn. So that's one example of many of literature or war literature that is fairly recent to the 20th century, but is happening before World War I. Now with World War I and the other shifts to modernism, as I'm saying, there's, we're not gonna be able to write war literature the same. You know, we, people don't think the same. People don't express themselves in cultural forms the, the, the same. Uh, so what was World War I? Uh, so obviously this uh, uh, conflict on a grand scale between 1914 and 1918, between the uh, two alliance uh, systems in Europe, um, and the large scale of the operations combined with the nature, the kind of the culmination of industrial era weapons that they were that were brought to bear by both sides translated into extremely high death tolls. So uh, according to some figures I've cited here, you know, these, these estimates range, but this is as good as any. 16.5 million deaths, military and civilian among the participating nations which would represent about 1.75% of deaths as a percentage of the, the nation's uh, population. So extremely high death toll. And here we can see the, the, alliance, uh, the alliances here, uh, the central powers in UK, France, Russia. <clears throat> so a couple of things exacerbated the death tolls and, and the nature of the war in, in, during World War I. As I said, the industrial era, the industrialized nature of the weapons that had kind of culminated to a certain point of, of, um, uh, of intense firepower of artillery, of, of machine gun weaponry, and um, without having yet the uh, other breakthroughs in mobile warfare that we would see later in World War II meant that we had very static trench warfare with high degrees of attrition, no movement, no mobility, just two sides pounding each other with artillery and machine guns across, across wasted plains with, with lines of trenches stretching, especially on the Western Front, from uh, basically from the, from the North Sea to the, the border of, of Switzerland. Um, so the trenches were originally used in the 17th century during uh, siege, uh, sieges of fortresses. And then during the 19th century with the increasing firepower of machine guns and uh, et cetera, both sides had to resort to trenches during the American Civil War. So what we see on the right are some, some civil, American Civil War trenches from the year 1865. So we, during the American Civil War, we already had a glimpse of what we were gonna see in World War I. So here's a representation on the right of, of the Western Front uh, trench system. I'm going to refer a few times to the Battle of the Somme. It was uh, a battle that was fought over a few months around this village of Albert. And see, this is the River Somme is which, from which it gets its name. And the attempt was to push forward and get uh, capture a couple of uh, villages uh, to, the, to the east of the Somme there. Um, and it's often referred to as a kind of a classic example of the futility of the battles, especially on the Western Front uh, of World War I. It lasted so many months, nothing was achieved. Uh, some historians today want to debate that. I don't want to go right in fully into that. I've, I've noticed that, you know, there's some historians today will say that although the, the um, England, France did not achieve substantial territorial gains. They, let's say they drained the uh, Imperial German army's resources so extensively that it led eventually, that it, let's say, hastened the victory in 1918. That may be so, but it cost, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of lives, um, maybe over a million. And uh, the, the uh, let's say the, the cost benefit analysis doesn't work out in my opinion. Um, so on this Western Front, as I said, you've got systems of trenches uh, roughly along this line going from the, uh, the North Sea the, or the English Channel here to the, uh, to the border with Switzerland. Um, 
And we have millions of soldiers on each side faced off in, in these elaborate trenches. And it's not just one trench, right? There's elaborate systems of trenches with, with defense in depth. So, you know, a, a system of trenches behind the trench that's, that's the most forward leaning, uh, backed up with artillery, backed up with um, machine gun nests, um, with, um, with uh, concrete em 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 emplacements and uh, fortresses. Um, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it means a long deadly war of attrition on a grand scale. Um, and just a sense of the scale, I've got a few bullets here in terms of what we need to put our minds around in terms of comparing the Battle of the Somme to the Battle of Agincourt. And uh, I'm just gonna highlight again this book. I've referenced it a, a couple of times. I've referenced a few of his books, John Keegan's books, and I recommend him as an author and I recommend this book. The face of battle. So he does this very well. He's, he's, he looks closely at three battles, Agincourt, Waterloo, and the Somme. Okay, so uh, Agincourt, as we know, 1415, uh, the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, and the Battle of the Somme, 1916. So, uh, so a few battles separated by 500 years. Um, and in each case, we have an expansion of scale an expansion of the lethality of the weapons, uh, et cetera. So there's a number of conclusions he's trying to draw by, by okay, so is that going to continue progressing in that direction? But just to compare Psalm and Agincourt. So we, we looked at Agincourt in, in Henry V, and in terms of the number of soldiers involved, in the Battle of the Somme, we're looking at millions of soldiers involved, whereas in Agincourt, we had tens of thousands. And the duration of the battle, the Battle of the Somme lasted four months, whereas Agincourt lasted a few hours. The scale of the battle, so the Battle of the Somme, the front there that I'm, I'm pointing out on the right here by this village of Albert, is about 15 miles long, whereas Agincourt was 500 yards. So just in, in every sense of scale, the, the battles, lethality, number of men involved, the, the, the scope of the battle uh, has, has accelerated um, exponentially in, in, in the time. <clears throat> now, so what we see in World War I um, are the, the rise of these World War I poets. So uh, previous to World War I, any war literature was generally uh, at least at least the war literature that we know of has been for the most part written by non-combatants. So aristocratic aristocratic uh, uh, people sitting comfortably, maybe sip, sipping some cognac and, and waxing about the bravery of, of, of the charge of the light brigade. Uh, with World War I, there's a prolifer proliferation of poetry by these quote unquote soldier poets. And here, even early on in the war, we still had examples of patriotic poetry. So the earth, at the beginning of the war, it still had that strain of 19th century patriotism, that they were going to die for England. So Rupert Brooke is an example of that. And, and we see here he uh, died uh, at the age of, um, uh, at the age of 28 um, and uh, in World War I. He was uh, a friend of uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, who he had befriended at uh, Cambridge. He joins the Navy and then uh, had seen some action in Nor Northern Europe, but then goes to the Mediterranean in support of the Dardanelles action. And on the way there, he died of blood poisoning. So this is, that's a picture of Rupert Brooke on the side there. And he wrote this poem, 1914, called The Soldier. And as I said, try to think of this in the strain of what you might expect in the tradition of the, the Emerson poem we read. <clears throat> if I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. Now this, notice this notion of the, the dying for a plot of land. So the territory and for England, for the nation. There shall be in that rich earth, a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. Now again, think of 
if this were Achilles writing a poem in, in Homer, if, we, if Achilles were relating a poem that he wrote about himself, if I die on this dust, it would be about sing my praises, sing my praises forever, my glory. It's not about sing the praises of, of, of uh, Achaia or whatever. Uh, there's no sense of the, the, the nation uh, as ethnic cultural group that, to which he's celebrating, right? Um, and think this heart all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter, learnt of friends and gentleness, in hearts at peace under an English heaven. So that what gives, obviously here, what gives a meaning to that death is a continuity found in the identity of Englishness, I would say, and how his contribution to the noble, the noble nature of what it means to be English in, in the poet's sense of that word, um, his contribution in dying uh, to that sense of identity will be preserved in people's memories. So other poets, as the, as the war progresses, you know, and we, we start to have battles such as the Battle of the Somme, where people are getting mowed down by machine guns for no reason, um, we, some of these idealistic themes peel away, right? And, and people start to write uh, poetry in line with the other trends of modernism that we'll talk about in the next lecture. So plain spoken language, realism, imagism. So instead of the idealistic language and themes down to real gritty themes of people dying in war. And some examples of this, uh, Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon are two very good examples of this. If you wanna look into this, we'll, we'll look at a couple of their poems right now, but if I encourage you to look at others, they're very, um, let's say jolting, they're very realistic. Um, so, so Wilfred Owen uh, wrote this poem called Dulce Decorum Est. Um, so maybe people remember from the beginning of the course, I talked about Horace had described, had, had used this phrase, you know, it's a uh, sweet and right it is to die for one's, um, for one's fatherland. Uh, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Um, <clears throat> Dolce et decorum est. So uh, Wilfred Owen writes a poem using that title ironically, and we'll look at that. So he's uh, uh, the sense in World War I that one's dying for one's fatherland. Uh, so it begins to look at, uh, begins to be looked upon with ironic distance and, and be seen as it is in this poem, Wilfred Owen's poem, as quote unquote an old lie. So uh, Wilfred Owen was killed at the age of 25, so desperately young, these people. And that's old for some of the people that were killed there, you know, many, many, the kids much younger. And even 25, though, so young, so much potential there that's lost, right? Um, and he died serving in France. So here's this poem. <clears throat> it's about a gas attack. So uh, the other thing I didn't mention was the, to add to the horrors that I already described were the, the uh, chemical warfare. So here's an example of soldiers wearing these, these gas masks that they had at the time. And you'll see there's a kind of a reference. It's good to keep this in mind. There's a reference to this later. Bent double like old beggars under sacks. Knock kneed coughing like hags. We cursed through the sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. So uh, less of a lilty Id idyllic language here, kind of more of a dirty down to earth language. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping silently behind them, silently behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. So he, the poet, 
the, the voice of the poem sees this person who's gasping, who wasn't able to get the gas mask on quickly enough, dim through the misty panes and thick green light. So the, uh, we go back, so these gas masks have these little panes of green glass there, right, uh, as part of their protection. And, and the poet seeing them through these panes of gl green glass, and it's like looking at them under a green sea. I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling forth from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent of some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. So um, very uh, powerful poem there, in my opinion. Uh, so we have in the chat Melody saying, dolce et decorum est des, des Deceitful, good one. Melody's full of puns all the time there. Um, so uh, again, a couple of things to note, the realism of the language, the image, the sense of trying to get a real image um, and the sense of, obviously there's no, there's no sense of this pointing to some higher redemptive meaning behind the deaths here. It's, uh, it's rather the poem is about exposing the lies, exposing the lies under which previous poets or previous societies had kind of clothed war, okay? Now, and I'll end with this poem this by uh, uh, Siegfried Sassoon, Sassoon, excuse me, Attack, 1918. So at dawn, the ridge emerges massed and done in the wild purple of the glowering sun, smoldering through spouts of drifting smoke that shroud the menacing scarred slope. And one by one, tanks creep and topple forward to the wire. The barrage roars and lifts, then clumsily bowed with bombs and guns and shovels and battle gear, men jostle and climb to meet the bristling fire. Lines of gray muttering faces masked with fear. They leave their trenches going over the top while time ticks blank and busy on their wrists and hope with furtive eyes and grappling fists flounders in mud. Oh Jesus, make it stop. So here a, a kind of a, again, a description of an image, an image here of, of men going over the top, that phrase for getting up out of their trench to make an assault, uh, in, in most cases suicidal, uh, across no man's land and trying to attack the, 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 the enemy trenches. So here uh, they're, they're, they're weighed down, their faces are gray, the landscape is gray, they're weighed down with their equipment. Um, hope is floundering in the mud. The only thing going over the top are, the, are them with their wristwatches that are counting the seconds that are left of their lives, literally. So uh, again, a haunting image. Um, like, uh, like Wilfred Owen's poem, um, this one has a regular meter though. It has more of a regular meter. Um, although uh, the language again is, has less of a, an idyllic um, pastoral imagery to it that uh, Rupert Brooks had and the Concordium had. had. Um, here it's again the realistic imagery of, of mud and blood and death and without uh, seemingly a, a redemptive image of meaning that, that would kind of make all of this worthwhile. So as a one thing to keep in mind is how these poets and their experience are part of and con contributing to and influenced by this movement of modernism that is Virginia Woolf is a leading avatar of. And uh, so next class, as I said, we'll see 
we'll see the uh, bit of an introduction to modernism as an aesthetic movement, a literary movement, but a little, some reference to the visual arts. And then in the class after that, we'll start looking at Mrs. Dalloway. So thank you very much, everyone.